commentary, verse by verse Bible study. The goal is to make sure that you understand each and every word that we're studying here. That way, some of you who are struggling with your Bible reading because the excuse is it's too hard to read, if you would to keep attending this class, you'll get the common sense just eventually of the reading, and then you'll be able to do it yourself. All right, let's look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning. All right, so notice that's the uh, best place where the text starts, in the beginning. So what happens at the beginning? God. It is very interesting that when I went to UC Berkeley class, that when they talked about Genesis 1-1, they criticized all the modern Bibles. But then they praised the King James Bible. And I was like, uh, I must be smoking marijuana or something. <laughs> so what's, what's going on here? And then, but what I heard was true because the key reason was because it was an English class they obviously critiqued all the modern Bible versions because their English language was very watered down. And when then it started out the language in the beginning God, as you find it in the King James Bible, it was appropriate. Next to beginning is God. And if you look at the Hebrew text, they do the same thing too. They deliberately put God with the beginning. That is crucial. That is key. That shows the power of the King James Bible text already against the modern Bible versions. Whereas the modern Bible versions don't start it out that way. In the beginning, God. Now, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So God created what? The heaven and the earth. If you notice in the text here about in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, there are already several things of, that make up all of your universe and the elements of science that you need right here. You go with time. Time is found in the beginning. So then one is time. Second is motion, which is created. Third, you see energy. What? God created. God created. And then you see space, heaven. And then you see uh, earth right there, the earth, all the physical objects matter. So notice that you already have all the elements of science in place, just in Genesis 1, 1 alone. All right, you want me to repeat that again in case some of you lost it? In the beginning is time. Created is motion. God created is energy. The heaven, that space, earth is matter. Let me give an intro to the book of Genesis, as I've always done uh, in my other readings. So here are the introductions that you want to know about the book of Genesis. So the book of Genesis was written by Moses. So notice if you look at the title of your King James Bible, the first book of Moses called Genesis. So Moses wrote five books. For those of you who didn't know, it's otherwise also called the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch. Pentateuch is also known as the first five books of Moses. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Moses is the author. It has 50 chapters. 50 chapters. 1,534 verses. 1,534 verses. 38,267 words. 38,267 words. All right, go play with those numbers, Sean, after Bible study, okay? It is found first in the list of books in the Hebrew canon and the English canon. That's amazing. So in the English canon of the Bible or in the Hebrew canon of the Bible, Genesis is where it begins. Why? Because it is the book of beginnings, Genesis. The word Genesis is kin to generations. See, Genesis. That's why you'll hear some gen, uh, genesis, uh, uh, <laughs> genetics and other scientists where they like to use the word Genesis for themselves. Why? Because it's kin to generations, genes, or generate. That's the idea. 
it marks the book as, quote unquote, the book of beginnings. It record, and this is found at Dr. Upman's data. So I'm going to specifically uh, quote from Dr. Upman's data. He says it records the beginning of the heavens, the earth, man, sin, redemption, the races, and the covenants. Its outstanding characters are Adam and Eve, Noah and Enoch, Cain and Abel, Lot and Abraham, Isaac and Ishmael, Esau and Jacob, Joseph and Judah. The types of Jesus Christ in the book are Adam, Abel, the Lamb, Isaac, the Ark, Judah, Shiloh, and Joseph. For some of you who might go, wait, I want to hear that again. I can't repeat that again, so just rewind the video. The types of Antichrist are Cain, Ham, Nimrod, Laban, Ishmael, Esau, and Pharaoh. Every major doctrine in both testaments is found in the first 12 chapters. That's what he claims. And the book is a supplement to the book of Revelation. Why? Oh, you learn at Wednesday, making the Bible an infinite circle. Amen. Isn't that amazing? With neither beginning nor ending in regard to its inexhaustible riches. So that's a great introduction to the book of Genesis that I quoted from Dr. Upman. Now, continuing on at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, you notice that the verse automatically debunks all philo philosophical beliefs out there and all false religions. Mm -hmm. Genesis 1, 1 alone debunks everything. You might say what? Well, for example, it debunks polytheism. So, in the ancient times, they believed more than one God. But, the Bible says in the beginning, singular, God. So, polytheism is out of the picture. Notice that atheism is also out of the picture. The atheist will get a heyday just reading that first verse. In the beginning, God, meaning that God exists. It also debunks evolution. Notice that it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Notice that the heaven and the earth did not evolve by itself. It was created. Notice that the Bible also debunks existentialism. You might say, how so? Because there is a group who take the existential branch, and existentialism, you can find it in philosophy, psychology, but mingling up with theology as well. It's a very interesting branch. I actually did my... Uh, final uh, paper for my uh, master's degree on psychology on existentialism, which is a mingling of philosophy and psychology. It was the toughest, but I was so interested in that, and then the Lord blessed me with a good grade after that. So existentialism, I've done some uh, research onto that and psychology in a master's level. And let me tell you something, is that existentialism, the idea is where they believe that God where some group of people from this branch believe that God, after he created something, it's up to mankind. So God left it be. And then mankind would do things themselves. That's where you get some deists from. Some deists from. Uh, if you recall, the founding of America, sure, it may have started with God, but it's built within a pagan philosophy too. And that's deism that time. A lot of the founding fathers believed in deism, for some of you who didn't know. So it debunks... Uh, existentialism because man has uh, man didn't do anything about it it's God God created it God didn't just create it and leave mankind alone another thing that it also debunks is that it debunks the Eastern religions it debunks the Eastern religions concerning about uh, becoming one with the universe so it debunks Brahmism uh, well, let's put Hinduism here and Eastern religions. So we'll just put Eastern religions. Hinduism, Buddhism, Brahmanism, etc., etc. Eastern religions, they believe that everything goes back into the universe. That if you keep repeating this cycle of reincarnation, the attainment and the enlightenment is to go back into the uni universe itself. Universe is the origins of everything. But no, that's not true. God is the origin of all the universe. The beginning itself is not the universe. 
By the way, you notice that atheists and evolutionists would kind of believe with Eastern religions on that aspect. The universe always existed. No, universe did not always exist. God was the beginning. God's the beginning, and he's the one that put the universe into existence. It has not always been here. So notice how the Bible just debunks uh, point after point after point of all your pagan philosophies, beliefs, and religions nowadays. So God created everything. So I hope that this thing has been helpful to you. It debunks all kinds of philosophical branches. Genesis 1, 1 alone. Genesis. So you notice that the higher education system, they'll automatically hate your Bible. Amen. Automatically, as soon as they read Genesis 1-1. Yeah. Why? It debunks and dest uh, destroys everything that they believe in. Mm -hmm. Let's continue reading on. So we know that in the beginning, God created the heaven, and then he also created the earth. But something happened. The Bible says, and the earth was without form and void. So notice that void, it means empty, without form. So it has no form to it. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. So notice over here that there's a deep and then there's darkness covering it. Now the question is, uh, what happened here? A lot of creationists, they'll teach that, well, the Lord was pr uh, putting the earth at the preparation stage for his creation. That's not true. The, uh, you read the verse as it says, at verse 1, it didn't say God prepared. He said created. When he created the earth... It's created where it is inhabited and it has form. Did it say created past tense? Yes or no? Yes. If it's past tense and created, it should have form and it should be inhabited. But why is it without form and void? That contradicts scripture. Go to Isaiah. Isaiah. And then we'll look at chapter 45. Isaiah. We'll look at chapter 45. This is why we believe in the doctrine called the Genesis Gap. The Genesis Gap. What is the Genesis Gap? It's also called the Gap Theory. But I hesitate to say theory because I don't believe that it's a theory. I believe that it is a fact. The Gap Fact. The reason why we believe in the Genesis Gap <clears throat> is because of the scriptures. It's simple and it's plain. You might say, what does that teach? The Genesis Gap teaches that God created the heaven and the earth, but notice that this is before Adam. This is before the other six days of creation. So then what was going on here? What was going on here was that God created the earth and the heaven, but then the sons of God, the angels were the ones living in there, as well as Lucifer. But then because of their sin against their maker, God had to send a universal flood that drowned out and filled out the universe, the earth. And then God had to start from scratch because there was darkness and the deep, right? Look at verse 2, darkness and the deep. That's not creation, that's chaos. Yeah. That's not order, that's disorder. So because of that, God had to send some kind of catastrophic event. This wasn't a preparation created stage, one in the world. So God had to send a chaotic event that would wipe out the sons of God's civilization and start from scratch beginning with mankind, a lower form of creature, not the angels. Isn't that what, it, doesn't it make sense why Lucifer and the fallen angels will hate you and try to attack you? That makes a lot more sense. Why? You're... You've taken over their civilization that the Lord once gave to them. And they hate you because you're far weaker than they are. All right, look at Isaiah chapter 40, 45, verse 18. For thus saith the Lord that what? Created the heavens, God himself that what? Formed the earth and made it. He hath established it, he what? Created it not in vain. If he created the earth not in vain, then what? He what? Formed it to be inhabited. That's very important. All right, going back to the main text. Going back to the main text. So notice that this supports the fact that if you don't believe in the Genesis gap, then you're going to contradict Scripture. You have to believe God created it, and then he sent in a disorder and chaos. Let's also look at the book of Job. Look at the book of Job. 
Notice that as soon as God put the foundations, foundations of the earth, sons of God were right there. Look at chapter 38. Job chapter 38. The companion passage you want to turn to is 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter 3. So then 2 Peter 3 and Job 38. My recommendation is to watch my uh, video, The Gap Theory. Uh, I would do a more thorough analysis and defense of the Genesis Gap. Right here, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But I'm going to give you enough where it should prove that there is a gap. That there has to be a gap. Look at Job chapter 38. The Bible says here at verse 6, Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? Verse 4, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? All right, where were you, Job? A man. You weren't there, but the sons of God were at verse 7. When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Look at that. As soon as God put the foundation of the earth, why were they shouting for joy that time? Because it was created for them that time. They were the ones there, not mankind. God puts it as the opposite at verse 4. Where were you, mankind? We weren't in existence. All right, go to 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. If your hand's already there, I'm going to read it immediately. The Bible says at verse 4, And saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were. What's the timeline? From the beginning of the creation. So notice this is not going to be Noah's flood that I'm going to be reading to you. This is a different flood because the timeline is from the beginning of the creation. Compare that with Genesis 1, uh, 1 and 2. In the beginning what? The earth and then there were waters. Now, doesn't that go hand in hand when you look at verse 5, 4 and 5, beginning and then 5 all of a sudden waters. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Notice that this is a universal flood because it says heavens, plural. And notice the wording, the earth standing out, of the water and in the water like this this is a huge submerging of the whole universe itself you might say well uh, I don't think it's universal I think it's just global no because look at the uh, verse 7 context context what does the Bible mean by heavens and earth universe but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment why? Do you know, you know what that is? If you studied Revelation 22, Revelation 22, God gets rid of the old heavens and the earth, and then he puts a new heaven and a new earth. We all know that's universal. We know verse 7 is undoubtedly the companion text of Revelation 22, the universal destruction. So then why can't you follow the context of verse 5 and 6? Scripture triumphs. You have to understand that. Scripture triumphs. Now, there are a few uh, uneasy feelings because of Genesis 1-2. First re uh, the first reason that there's an uneasy feeling to accept the Genesis gap is because of evolution. So because of evolution, they have a fear of believing that. So then you're caving into evolution, saying that the earth is millions of years old, and then that's when God did the six days of creation. No, we're not saying that. Well, where does the Bible say over here that the earth is uh, millions of years old? It never said that. Where does the Bible talk about evolution? It actually destroys evolution at verse 1 through 2. Verse 1, it destroys evolution. As a matter of fact, Genesis gap, if you accept it, it would destroy evolution, not support it. You might say, why? Now, creationists don't realize this. When they argue verse 1 and verse 2... God uh, created uh, the earth and he put it in a watery state at verse 2 as a preparation process for his creation. That's what creationists teach because they don't want to say verse 2 is destruction. They want to say verse 2 is preparation for his creation. That's a creation stage. Why, wait a minute then, if they teach that, evolutionists teach that. 
evolutionists, they take Genesis 1, 1, and 2 to teach that Genesis 1, 2 is the earth in a hydrological stage. It's in a watery aquatic stage. And then through process of time, that's where life was formed. Life was created. We don't believe in that. We believe, no, that water is not creating life. It's destruction. Creationists should know that too, by the way. Creationists use the argument about the water and then about sunlight and other aspects and elements in the universe, how it's impossible for life to form just like that. So how in their right mind would they use this water as a creation process and stage? So who's the one caving into evolution? You notice that? Another thing that people feel uneasy about this is, well, that's, that's just too much of a story to put at verse 1 and verse 2. The Bible never said Lucifer and the sons of God. And to put all of a sudden where God created the heaven and the earth, and then there's a destruction, and then verse 3 is the six days of creation, that's too much to believe. No, it's not too much to believe in. That's why we call it the Genesis gap, verse 1 and 2 compared to verse 3. There's a gap. There's a gap in between. The gap is where this fills in the gap, the Lucifer and the sons of God and the universal destruction. So verse 2 to verse 3, there is a gap in between. Or verse 1 and verse 2, there's a gap in between. So a lot of people don't believe in that. Uh, why didn't God make mention of that? Well, it's pretty simple. The Lord, uh, a lot of times if you read the scriptures, the Lord doesn't make mention of a lot of things and he'll put gaps. Look at the book of Daniel. Chapter 1, Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. All right, I better wrap this up now. That way you can hear the other good stuff in Genesis. Let's look at Daniel chapter 1. Now notice that there's a gap here when we look at verses 1 and 2 of Daniel. Just like Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Daniel chapter 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And then all of a sudden, notice, and the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored. That's talking about Daniel and the uh, uh, other children of Israel. But you'll notice that at all of a sudden, if you were to look at verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, and verse 4, that all of a sudden that there's a gap in between. There's a lot of information that's missing. But God jumps ahead. As a matter of fact, if you start from verse 1 in the third year uh, of the reign of Jehoiakim and then go throughout the process of time with Daniel, that's a long time. And there's a lot of information that's missing in between. Okay, let's go back. Let's go back to our main text. Now, there are three major captivities. Uh, this is just a background info. I'm just going to say it briefly for some of you who don't know within uh, about Daniel. So then they go, they see the conflict, and there's some debate about the count of the year with Daniel chapter 1 because there's like a huge time jump or time conflict. But then there are basically three major captivities, 606 B.C. by Jehoiakim, and then there's 598 B.C. by Jehoiachin and 586 B.C. by Zedekiah. So notice that there are three major captivities. And then that's when we can see that the total destruction of Jerusalem happened, etc. So then uh, it, some people, they just only look at one thing in the Bible and assume it makes a conclusion. But sometimes the Lord will only give partial information and deem it fit to skip a lot of the other information to go down to the next point. That's important to understand. Same thing with Genesis 1. All right, let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Now let's continue reading at verse 2. The Bible says, And the Spirit of God 
moved upon the face of the waters. Now, notice here that the Spirit of God is starting to move now. So where it, there originally was destruction, now Spirit, that means basically like pneuma, it's like breath. That's where life is received. So God is coming down here. And he's moving on the face of the waters. He's about to do something. The Spirit of God is about to do something. It moved upon the face of the waters. Now I find it interesting that God's Spirit is now moving upon the face of the waters. Why is that? Because there were spirits that departed. Now we're going to look at several passages. We're going to look at the book of Jude. Or actually, it would be 1 Peter, excuse me. We're going to look at 1 Peter. Let's see here. We're going to turn to our Bibles to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 3. 1 Peter, chapter 3. 1 Peter, chapter 3. And we might need to compare that with another text. That way people can understand what this is going to go for. So we're going to look at 1 Peter, 2 Peter 2 as well. 2 Peter chapter 2. So then it'll be 1 Peter 3, 2 Peter 2. That way we can fully understand. And the last text, the last te your text you're going to go to is Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. We're going to look at 2 Peter 2. 1 Peter 3 and Ecclesiastes chapter 12. You know why I find it interesting that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water? Because there's death all over. So because there's death all over, then the Spirit of God has to start creation. Why? Because death means basically that the Spirit departs. For some of you who didn't know, a lot, because of this universal flood, Spirits were departing. Who are these spirits? These are the fallen angels. So there's an amount of fallen angels who got affected by this universal flood, and then these spirits went down to hell. Now, let's look at the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Look at verse 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall what? Return unto God who gave it. So notice that at death, at death, the Spirit departs, and the Lord uh, does whatever He wants with the spirits. Well, He sure did with these fallen angels. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. Verse 4 and 5. The Bible says, For if God spared not the angels that sin." but cast them down to hell and deliver them into chains of darkness. Now look at this. Remember Genesis 1, 2. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. Now when God prepared the darkness, he did not spare those angels, cast them down to hell. Look at verse... So then notice here that the Lord, he sent these angels down to hell. Now look at uh, 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Notice what they are worded as. Notice what they are worded as. It's 1 Peter chapter 3. And then we'll read verse 19. By which also he went and what? Preached unto the spirits in prison. So notice over here that there are spirits in prison. So it shows here how these sons of God, these fallen angels, when God uh, prepared hell, why did God prepare hell? For the devil and his angels. Matthew chapter 25, right? So then when did hell begin? When did hell start? It's for these fallen angels. Right. Well then, if you get rid of the Genesis gap, how are you going to put that origin of hell? It makes a lot more sense when you put the Genesis gap. It was at that time when God said darkness. Isn't that what the verse says in 2 Peter? That God put them under chains of darkness. Why? He prepared hell that time. He, through this universal uh, catastrophic event, 
I mean, there was fire, there was water, and there was darkness. It was total chaos. It was such a huge chaos. I mean, Noah's flood was a small example of that with volcanoes erupting, coming out of hell, uh, and then water falling down, and then a huge uh, worldwide flood spreading, etc. That's only a small portion of this universal flood right here. See, this makes sense. The Genesis gap, it makes a lot more sense that it exists, especially following the pattern of Noah. You can see a cycle that's repeating. Now, these spirits, they departed, affected by this universal flood, went down to hell. They went down to hell. So because of that, the Holy Spirit had to come down here. The Holy Spirit had to come down here. And then why? Because spirit means life. When a spirit departs, it means death. So what's going to happen? Creation is about to begin. And this is where, next to the greatest story ever told, Jesus dying on the cross, is the next most greatest event, is the creation of man. You and I are born. And if we, you and I weren't born, we, wouldn't, uh, there, we would have no story. We would have no story. The Bible would be much more different. The Bible says at verse 3, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. So notice that God speaks that there's light. Why does God speak? Because spirit means breath. See that? That's why the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Why? Because God's about to speak something into existence. It's very interesting that I could be wrong about this, but there are some phys uh, physicists and even lost uh, atheist or agnostic scientists that try to discover the origins of the universe and they believe it's done through vibrations. They believe there was something about vibrations that just put the universe into existence. And I'm like, well, hey, stupid, it's the voice of God, the word of God. And he spoke it into existence. Go to John chapter one, John chapter one. Why do you think that the Bible says that the word was the one who created the universe? In the beginning was the word. How about that? In John chapter 1 and verse 1. The Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Notice that's the Word that created everything. All right, go back to Genesis chapter 1 verse 3. So basically, when God says something, it must be created. God said, let there be light. Let there be light, and guess what? And there was light. Oop, just like that. <laughs> just like that. Now, it is interesting that if you go to the Berkeley campus, and then you look at their famous seal, it says, let there be light. And they're the most left-wing, atheist type of bunch that you would ever meet in this world. It's so amazing. It's so amazing that even some form of the Bible is so powerful and alive that even the most hardcore liberal atheist type of school that you would think of would even have to put it on its plaster. Okay, so there was light. Verse 4, and God saw the light that it was good. When God created light, it's good. And God divided the light from the darkness. Now, it's simple as that. God saw the light, it's good, but he divides... This light from the darkness. Hence, you see the half-half here. Uh, but this is metaphorical, okay? So don't just take it too literally that all these trees are in the dark or something like that. So, but the half-half part, notice this part is light. This part is dark. Why? God literally divided the light from the darkness. So then, notice that this is before the sun. This is before the moon. So then... There is light that exists before the sun. So where did this element of light come from? It's very simple. Go back to John 1 again. John 1. The Word is what created everything, right? But also it's light. Go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Notice at verse 4, just keep reading on. In Him was life, and the life was the what? Light of men. And the what? Light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the what? Light. 
of the light that all men through him might believe. That's apparently Jesus Christ. That's apparently Jesus Christ. So the light is God. Some of the, cre uh, some of the creationists, and sadly even, I think, yeah, Larkin and Schofield, sadly, some of the people bow down to science, but it's science falsely so-called, so-called evolution. Where, well, there must be a scientific explanation for this. So it's some kind of light that's within the universe and etc. Or that there was a light over there, but it was just covered by darkness. And then the sun came out uh, at the fourth day, and that was a different type of light. Look, you're just stretching things. Just make it simple with scripture. God's the light. It's that simple. Now go to Revelation. The Bible even shows you at the end. Look at Revelation. And we'll look at chapter 21, Revelation chapter 21. Now, think about this. Notice that God didn't create the darkness then. Did you notice that? The Bible never said God created the darkness and it was good. Darkness was already there. And here's the second thing that supports the Genesis gap. If you think that verse 2 is his creation process, then why didn't God put darkness as the first part of his creation? <coughs> Why did he make light the first part of his creation? How about that? So then darkness is a sign of not creation, but chaos. See that? It's chaos. It's something negative. It's something destructive and bad. Light, on the other hand, is a sign of something positive and something that's good connected to God. I mean, even the Eastern religions saw that way ahead. The devil's people saw that way ahead. Light and darkness. Good and evil, yin and yang, both elements must exist so that the universe can come into existence. Well, that's baloney because obviously at Revelation 21, God is doing fine without evil when all of it is cast into hell. All right, He doesn't need the universe to exist with evil. Uh, but these Easterners, they have a partial knowledge of something. The partial knowledge is they're getting it from Genesis 1, 1 through 4. Basically, there was evil right there. Because why? Of the destruction. Not because the universe needs it. It's because God had to destroy the universe. Destroy the wicked ones. Because there was evil at the beginning, but then also good at the beginning too. Because God had to put light. So you see where these Greek pagan philosophers get their idea from? The Easterners. Greek pagans, they believed in some kind of God. Uh, in the English word would be chaos. That chaos had to exist so that light or whatever wording that they like to put it, these Greek, that these Greek pagans did, that the gods were able to create the universe and the worlds. How about that? All of them are grabbing things from the word of God, the Bible. Satan is trying to copycat the Bible. So then if that's the case, darkness is not created. It's always been there. Light was the one that was created then the idea is this, darkness is not good, and light is connected to, to God. Well, then at the end, then, if God cast all of evil into hell and that's out, then what would be left over? No darkness, but just light, and the light is from God. Look at the book of Revelation, chapter 21. Notice that the verse says, verse 25, And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be what? No night, no night there. Now remember that. Look at verse 5 of chapter 22. Chapter 22, verse 5. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them what? Yeah. Light. Okay. This is called in Revelation 20. 1 and 22 day. Is that right? Yeah. It's day. And then Revelation 21, 22 calls this night. Is that correct? All right. It calls darkness night and it calls light day. And it also connects light with who? God. Is that correct? Is that where the light comes from? Right. All right. Then you know that Genesis 1, the light comes from God. Because look back at Genesis 1. What did God say? What did God call light? And what did God call darkness? See that? They don't compare scripture with scripture. Look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 5. And God called the light what? 
Day, matching with Revelation 21, 22. That's from God then. And the darkness he called what? Night. See? Matches Revelation 21, 22. So we see right here, this is not some kind of, uh, darkness is not a good thing and this is not some kind of scientific aspect that you have to put in there. No, put it at a created aspect. It's from God, the light, period. It's not some kind of natural thing that the Lord did. It is very possible, though, which is very interesting, if that light comes from God and not from the sun or any other else, then when scientists talk about the fastest thing and they try to measure things, they're very dependent and they make a God out of light. And Einstein did the same thing, too. Why? Because light is God. It could be, it could be that the natural elements of light, where people try to grab it for themselves, it could be a portion from God's own light. It could be. All right. But the point is the origin is from God. It's not something natural by itself that creationists and scientists and evolutionists try to do. All right. If God divided light from darkness, that's important. He divided it. Where is the light from? Well, I, it's in heaven. It's in heaven. That's apparent at Revelation 21, 22, right? The light is from God and God is up in heaven. So this is up in heaven then the darkness is divided off of he heaven. So it's landing all over here on earth and in the universe. There's the division right there. That's the division. It's from heaven, the third heaven, compared to all of the universe and the earth down there. Now watch this now. Okay, that's going to be important. You might say, why is that important? Because of verse 6 and onward, and then we're going to at least finish this part. That way you can understand the full thing. The, Bi uh, the, the Bible says at the latter part of verse 5, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So God now puts time. So now God puts time in there. Why? Because he has light and darkness. So because he has light and darkness, but he didn't go up by a sun and moon system, see, of evening and morning. All he had was this division of day in heaven and night throughout this universe. And then he just puts evening and morning. So he hasn't have some kind of system. Uh, he doesn't have the sun and moon built the clock in yet. The fourth day will mention that the light replaces it then. Okay. Let's keep reading onward. At, so this is the first day. So this is the first day of God's creation. If that's the case that this is the first day... Uh, God's creation, and it's called, this day is called what? Evening and morning. Theistic evolution is a combination of theism and evolution. Basically, they believe God used evolution for all of the universe to exist. Well, that's baloney, okay? That's baloney because they teach that throughout uh, billions of years and through long processes of time, the six days of creation, or each day of creation, is supposed to represent a long age of time. That's what they teach. Uh, they'll use scripture for that one, like 2 Peter 3, for example. But that's easily debunked because they didn't even read Genesis 1. It, the day is described as what? Evening and morning. 24 hours. There you go. Evening and morning were the first day. That's what God perceived a day as when he created the world. Literally six days then. What? Not a long process of time and a day represents thousands of years. That's baloney. You're in la-la land. For PhD professors who know how to do research and to critique and find limitations to research and go through the methods and the discussions and find all the devices and go through all the statistics that they've learned about uh, regression and Pearson's correlation D and all this kind of stuff. It's amazing how stupid they are when they don't even read verse 5. Yeah. Idiots. Amen. Amen. All right. Yeah, I just felt so smart just now. Just yeah. saying that. <laughs> All right, let's look at verse 6. Verse 6. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Okay, so we know there's waters everywhere now. But now God has to put a firmament, whatever firmament is. Let's just put it that way. All right, now this is what you want to hear. This is going to be the most interesting part of your Bible study. And I better make this real quick. So whatever God does, he puts what he calls a firmament. 
in the midst of this water. So it's in the middle here. Some people don't realize that. So let me draw this. That way people can get it. So whatever this line is, it will be called firmament. That's all we'll say for now. It's in the midst of the waters, right? So in other words, it divides the top water and the bottom water. All right, let's keep reading here. And let it divide the waters from the waters. See, I told you so. So you just read the scripture as it says, the rest will play out. It divides the waters from the waters. See that? Let's keep reading. And uh, let me go to the other side. That way people can see this part. So it divided the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament. firmament. So God made the firmament and he divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. So I hope that the onliners or maybe some of you saw me pointing when I was reading that. That way you can understand. And it was so. And it was so. It's done. It's done. So notice that the Bible says, and it was so. It didn't say, and it was good. That's right. Did you notice that? Mm -hmm. you, it's kind of like today's language, so it's not hard to understand. Oh, it's so-so, right? There's a difference with, that's good, compared to, oh, that's so-so, right? Why did the Lord say so-so, not good? If you notice all the other parts of his creations, the remaining days, days he says, it's good, it's good, it's good, except the second day. He right. said, oh, it's so, so-so. Why? Because there's nothing good about the darkness here. Yeah. That shows it. There's nothing good about the darkness. Why? Because this, the darkness is where God created something negative for the devil and his angels. Remember, the Bible says the angels were what? Reserved to darkness. Right. They were reserved to chains of darkness. Now, remember, there's water and there's darkness here. Right? God divided the darkness. He took care of the darkness. But now it's the waters. So God had to divide the waters now. So then what's going on here is that, just read the next part of verse 8. And God called the firmament heaven. So this is called heaven. Wait a minute, but didn't God already created heaven at verse 1? Ah, see that? So this is a, a second heaven. Oh, I don't believe in multiple heavens. You don't know Bible. No, Second Corinthians right. chapter 12, Paul says he went to the third yeah. heaven. There are three heavens in your Bible. Well, I'm not going to turn there for time's sake. So the point is, is that notice that there are two different heavens. So we know, first clue, this firmament is called heaven. Okay? Here's the second clue. Just keep reading your Bible. That's it. It's so simple. Look at verse... 7, uh, 16, and God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, and he made the stars also, sun, moon, and stars, and where did he put them at verse 17? And God set them in the what? Firmament of the heaven. See that? So, oh, then we know the second heaven. It's referring to space. Right. It's referring to outer space in the universe out there. Right. Uh, the latter part of verse 8 says, and the evening and the morning were the second day. So all of this was created at the second day, 24 hours, evening and morning. So we know that this is referring to outer space. Now, what happened to these waters? So these waters above, we know what happened to them. Go to the book of Revelation. Revelation. And then we'll look at chapter 4, Revelation chapter 4. Okay, if this is, okay, think about this. Let's use common sense this. If this is the universe, okay, and then the waters are above this universe, what's above the universe? Isn't it heaven? Okay, then if the water is above the universe and heaven is above the universe, then could those waters be right here at heaven? Yeah, it's the footstool. It's the floor of heaven itself. Look at Revelation chapter 4. The Bible says, 
Mm, we're going to look at verse 6. And before the throne, that's the throne up in heaven, there was a what? Sea of glass like unto crystal. See that? That's the floor of heaven. Where did, the, where did heaven get that floor from? That floor of water, sea of glass. Right here, Genesis 1. Read your Bible. What happened to the waters under the firmament? It's simple. Just keep reading your Bible. Genesis 1 has all the answers. They just don't read, okay? Go to Genesis 1. Look at verse 9. Look at verse 9. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. Why? There's your answer. Verse 9 says the waters under this heaven turn to be seas today. So we get our seas today. That's where it came from. All right. Now, uh, some people might use this as a criticism against the King James Bible. Well, if you look at the Hebrew, rock or rocket, whatever, okay? I don't care. <laughs> so, rocket, you know. So, in the Hebrew, it means something strong and firm and solid. It doesn't mean where we would use it as an, ex, uh, an empty space, so to speak. So, that's the criticism that they would use. Now, this answer is actually pretty simple. They don't look at the dictionary itself. Now, I mentioned before that, and I think this caused a little bit of a misunderstanding, which I apologize for. When I mentioned about, I just said nonchalantly and simply, if you looked at the word firmament, it just means vault. It just means space, empty. And then some people said, no, it means the opposite. So let me clarify it here. The idea with firmament, just look at the word itself. It just mean, it means a beaten expanse. And it also means vault. That's important. Now, all you have to do is just look up an image of a vault. How a vault is built. So let me just do this poor example here. So here's a poor example. But the idea is, is that it's like this. That's the idea. It's like this. Because why? There's something solid here. Now, do we agree with that? Yeah, we, we agree there's something solid. But it's not uh, where you just all of a sudden jump up in the air and boom, you hit your head and you go, ow, I hit something solid and that's the firmament. No, it, it goes much higher above and that's the floor of heaven right here, the waters above. That's the solid part. But God says that he put uh, the sun, moon, and stars in the firmament, right? So is there a contradiction? No, it's like me saying that uh, there are flies flying in the vault or there are lights that you can see within the vault. What does that mean? It doesn't mean necessarily that has to be here. It can be here. Now look at this. Is this a solid area or is this an empty space? For a vault to exist, it has to have an empty space which is longer than the solid part. That's just common sense English. So then there's this huge empty space and then you're going to hit the solid part up there. And the solid part would be smaller or even thinner compared to the huge empty space itself. Why? Then it can't be a vault. Can't be a vault. See, there's your simple answer. It's like that. Why? Because we believe, and I'm not going to get into this, but this is where it gets deep. The Bible talks about uh, the shape of the universe where this becomes the roof, so to speak. This is the roof. This is the top of the vault. Heaven. You didn't know that? Why did the Bible say Mount Zion up there concerning about heaven? Why did the Bible liken to the shape of the universe to a triangle and the roof of it is heaven? All right, I'm not going to get into that, all right? <laughs> For some of you who are like, no, talk about it. Just look at uh, the shape of the universe. We have a YouTube video called Shape of the Universe. But see, there's your simple answer. By the way, the Bible calls it heaven at verse 8. See that? It calls it heaven. So it's not something where it has to be like some kind of solid roof that you all of a sudden you just jump and then you hit. It means vault. 
It means vault. And why I mean by like space is because when you look up the definition of a vault is like it says above the space is, a, is this uh, circular roof pattern or this vault, so to speak. So it will include the word space in there if you look up the word vault. Yep. So it's that simple. It's that simple. The Bible explains itself and solves all contradictions to the scriptures. All righty. And because it says the beaten expanse, it's supposed to be something that's laid out. See that? Why is it laid out? See, there has to be a space for it to lay it out. That's the idea for it to spread. So see, this shows more that the ferment, God knows what he's talking about. There's an empty space part, but there's no doubt something that's rock solid up there. That's hard and tough. And that's that sea of glass. That's why the Bible called a sea of glass. Not just sea. He called the bottom waters below seas, but the waters above he called a sea of what? Glass. Man, that book is amazing. And then we'll end it here. All right? All right, let's go to the third day of creation and other stuff later on. God, my Father, I pray that today's teachings were a blessing to the hearers. Dismiss us now with your blessing, and I pray that we have grown much more knowledge in the Scriptures to give you greater honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.